Hello there, Sir from 17 once again, bringing you chapter 4 in my enslaved hard difficulty video walkthrough. And this next little odyssey in our journey through the, to the west is entitled Wherefore Out Thou? And when it starts off, we're going to be doing the, the usual trick of running around as monkey and finding as many of these secret little caches of orbs as there are and uh, just checking out various nooks and crannies to make sure that we've got enough to upgrade things when we need to do so. And there's going to be quite a lot of platforming this one because these early these early few levels are, are a lot about evasion, they're all about the turrets, and uh, some of them are just, you know, basking in the vistas that this game throws at you and some of the, the unique and unconventional platforming. And right now, if you take a left off that that kind of like railing, what I was just on, you can swing across here and you will get to... Uh, one of the hidden masks and a, an orb cache. The reason why I'm not showing you where all the masks are is because a lot of them are very very simple and as you know these are not achievement guides unless I specify that that's exactly what they are. These are literally how to beat the game on its hardest difficulty in the least trouble. But uh, once you've picked up that little orb stash go back all the way to the platform that you jumped left from and then continuing going from the other angle. And this section right now, I am literally pressing one button and one direction and this platforming is flawless, it is fluid, it is fun and it is not bullshit whatsoever. It is how platforming should be and that is why this game is, is so fun. But as soon as you flip up here, you're going to fight uh, one of the lone mechs. You'll notice he blocks just then and every time they block, it means that they're going to counterattack with the three slash attack like he just did. As soon as he finishes his three slashes, that means he's vulnerable for an attack and you just have to get used to reading the enemies and you shouldn't have any problems with the fighting in this game but um, there is a learning curve and it is a little steep at first and this is the introduction to the, the shocking guy and this guy here is bad news because you can't hit him with the stun but don't worry he isn't as prone to block as the others and as you just saw if you hit him with your staff with the, the plasma charge shot you will do significant damage to him but he is always a threat and uh, something to note as well, when you take on the mechs, a handful of them will actually be faulty and it's displayed on the screen as, as an icon above the, the mech's head. And if you ever see an enemy that has one of those, always make sure you prioritize that enemy because it, it means that when you kill it, you'll generally get to do a little quick time event and the quick time event will generally end up in doing an area of effect that will either stun or neutralize the, the surrounding enemies and they can be really really useful for clearing out a bunch of closely grouped robots so always prioritize those ones you'll probably not be seeing that enemy uh, until a little, little bit later on in the game but right now we're just going to be enjoying a, a little bit more of the puzzling and we're going to be introduced to the the concept of the dogs which are giant mechanical creatures that um, are all about this planet and they will try and kill you uh, any possible time that they spot you and you generally run away from it from for so long and then you take it on in a lovely fight and uh, then you do a little chase sequence but that's coming up after this courtyard and this courtyard here is kinda challenging because as you can see you gain shot at by two separate turrets I think there's three actually and uh, the, the goal here is to get up onto the balcony where those guys are shooting you from so that you can disable them but to do it is not as easy as it looks uh, you basically have to go from cover to cover and um, you can use your your staff if you want to fire off the electric shot to stun people. You notice when I go between cover I roll a lot. The main reason for this is for some reason you seem to be a less of a target and the enemy AI doesn't want to shoot you as quickly so it's always best to try and roll when in doubt. The I'm playing Red Faction Armageddon at the moment and that game is very similar in that regard because there's a roll function on, on it and it performs pretty much a very very similar duty and it is kinda useful I'm not, I'm not really finding a need for it at the moment because truth be told I'm finding the game very easy but you never know later on it could get a lot more challenging but anyhow once you're up onto these side of the blocks you are safe it's a good opportunity to let your shield regenerate when you drop down here you'll notice you're gonna pick up some more of the electricity this will enable you to stun the the turrets that are shooting at you and uh, these guys, you will also notice that they have shields on themselves, which means you can't directly hit them with plasma. You have to either hit them with your stun attack or hit them with the electricity shot to take the shields off. And uh, this is probably the most challenging section because the cover's not very good, as you just saw. It does get damaged very quickly. But um, it's just a case of pushing forward, making sure that your shit regenerates and that you can take them out in order. 
And uh, from here on out, it is pretty simple now that I've got close to them. You just have to ignore the fact that I can't aim for Toffee with this weapon. But there you go. It will stun them for a certain amount of time. Uh, you can actually upgrade the length of time it stuns them for. Which is a pretty cool thing to use, but it's complete and utter preference. And, oh, I do apologise if I'm talking a little fast. I am kind of wired, because uh, I've been up all night, and... This is not something that's new to me, but right now it's kind of pissing me off because... Do you know something that I really hate? And <laughs> aside from all the stuff I mentioned in all the videos that I've made where I've gone on big opinionated rants about why I hate something or various things that piss me off. Well, all those aside, one thing that I really fucking hate is when I can't sleep. Uh, and I am somebody who... I am a night person by nature. I just seem to function better at night. Uh, I get more creative at night, I just seem to enjoy the time better, I don't know what it is, it's just a preference that's built into my, my body. And um, through choice I will generally stay up until 3 to, to 5 o'clock in the morning if I've got the flexibility you know, and the schedule to do so. It's just how I roll and I'll sleep till maybe 12, maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That is kind of the, the routine that I enjoy, that I frequent, because it's uh, just the one I prefer. And last night was one of those times where I, I was up late because I watched two films after I'd finished uh, completing L.A. Noir and playing a little bit of Red Faction and having a lot of fun with it. And when I'd watched them, I, I checked my, my YouTube before I went to bed. I did a little bit of editing and it was about five o'clock and I thought, fuck it, I'm going to go to bed now. I'm feeling a bit tired. And I laid down and as soon as my head hit the pillar, I just couldn't sleep. And I don't know if your guys are similar to me, but... As soon as I go to bed and I put my head on the pillow, I can't turn my brain off. For some reason, I seem to be the most creative motherfucker that has ever existed as soon as I try and switch things off. It's just silly. As soon as I shut my eyes and I tell my body to calm down and it's, you know, time to, to pack it in for the day, I just can't turn off for some reason. My mind's constantly racing, it's constantly thinking, and... I'm I'm thinking of, of all sorts of things from the most, you know, ridiculous stuff to what I'm going to do the next day or what achievements I want on a game or, you know, what I'm going to buy next or something silly like that or something that I watched, you know, if I've watched a film that's affected me and I'm in a certain reflective mood and then it'll it'll flip all the way to, to like, ideas for content on my YouTube for videos that I could make, uh, potential lines in commentaries where I'll literally come up with dialogues with my fucking self in my head inadvertently of something funny to say and... It's just crazy, and it's it's a pain in the ass because I always feel like, should I just fuck it? Should I just pull an all-nighter, go back to what I was doing and get all these great ideas jotted down or, you know, recorded or whatever they, they may contain? Or do I go to bed and, you know, face the piper the next day when I wake up midday feeling like shit? And it's always an interesting balancing act. And uh, for whatever reason, today I just decided to fuck it and stay up. And usually I don't bother because... Uh, when I was younger, I used to pull all-nighters all the time. It was just one of those things I did. If I got a new game, I generally wouldn't stop until I beat it. And sometimes that involved all-nighters. And um, when I was in between jobs and I'd finished college, I just got to that point where I was just pulling crazy hours because I was, I don't know, I was just kind of drifting. I was confused. And these days, I just prefer to go to bed. I just think, fuck it. I think, what's the point? I'm just going to feel crappy. So I might as well just accept it and just crash. But today, I've decided not to, and... Yeah, I don't know if it's a good choice. This commentary might not be very good, all depending, but, you know, I'm trying my best. If it's shitty, I'll just re-record it, but, you know, I, I, gen I don't like to re-record commentaries unless they're absolutely abysmal, and uh, luckily enough, I haven't had to, but... We're nine minutes into this one, and when you climb up this this lovely girder that leads towards this, this crane, we're going to be introduced to the dog that I mentioned before. Uh, we've got to do a bit more mild platforming and it all looks very cinematic and very exciting and truth be told the first time you do it it really is because this is this is one of those games that's gone under a lot of people's radar but it's definitely worth checking out just because it does a lot of things really well and it also approaches things from an interesting angle and that's definitely something that I like in, in these kind of games it's, it's spot on for that but yeah, man, fucking all night isn't, and you just know that if you stop moving or if you stop, you know, the adrenaline fuel that you've got going, you're just going to crash because you've got to keep yourself focused. You've got to either be eating, drinking something high of sugar or occupying your mind with doing something that, you know, takes your mind off the fact that you haven't rested in 20 or so hours and you could probably do with some sleep. And the moment you stop is the moment you crash and it's become so easy to just go to bed.
and it's almost like a you know a very mundane version of Crank, uh, Crank the pedestrian version. Nothing to do with having sex in public and killing people and driving cars through supermarkets, but it's up there. It's definitely up there. Once you've pressed that, if you drop down on the the ladder, it's going to pretty much be an on rails platforming section that looks really really you know fast paced and frenetic, but it's nowhere near as chaotic as it looks. It's really fun. And we're basically trying to make our way back to Trip now, but she's going to get ambushed by the dog when we get there. So make sure you take your time to pick up all the orbs, because unless you're going to be playing through the game again, you're not going to come back to any of these areas. There's no backtracking in this game, luckily enough. It's all uh, a fluid direction. But uh, I mentioned uh, I watched two movies last night. The, the first one I watched was a film called Valentine's Day. And I should have stayed away from the film. Uh, my instincts told me not to watch it because it had such a stacked cast and it was about such a fucking pointless, you know, theme. And generally, if a film synopsis says, you know, a group of, you know, unconnected people all experience a similar emotion or a similar series of events on a given day, it generally means that it's going to be a bullshit rom-com garbage fucking... Half of the crew, half of the crew, sorry, half of the cast are, you know, falling in love, the other half are falling out of love, and it's this culmination of good and happy and sad and, and laughing, and and it's generally two hours, and at the end of it you don't feel any different than you did when you started watching it, and you wonder what the fuck's just happened and where all the talent was wasted. And this is kind of exactly what I got from this film, because it follows a, a group of, a lot of really, really good actors who were in couples, and it's kind of like their day on Valentine's Day. And you've got your usual, you know, one who's in love with the guy and's telling her friend how happy she is, and it turns out he's fucking married, and he's, you know, gangbanging three other girls on the side. Then you've got the, the one who's getting married to the girl, and he's really happy, and it turns out she doesn't want to get married, and he's kind of stunned, and everybody else knew it was going to happen, but somehow he didn't. And by the way, right now, when this thing is chasing you, if you take a wrong turn or you hit a car, it will catch you very quickly and it's instant death. There's nothing you can do, it just means that you're going to hit the checkpoint. Uh, but luckily enough, the checkpoint is just before you started the section, so it's not to worry whatsoever. But yeah, the, there was so much promise in the film because it had such a strong cast and it was just a piece of dog shit, really. It just trundled along and did its cliched fucking archetypal behaviour of of bullshit and I knew exactly what I was going to get, I got exactly what I knew and um, yeah don't watch it, it's garbage. And the second film I watched was uh, an indie comedy, an indie drama slash comedy with Jeff Bridges, not Jeff Bridges, why do I always say that, with Jeff Daniels, sorry, the guy from Arachnophobia and Speed and uh, various other films. It also had um, Emma Stone in it, who's a fantastic upcoming actress. And um, he had Lisa Kudrow as well, who I don't really like because I never watched Sex in the City or whatever the fuck she was from, Friends or any of that garbage because I think it's just bile. But um, she was really good in this. She played his neurotic surgeon wife. And the general premise of it is uh, Jeff Daniels plays a, a failed author who's written one book. It kind of tanked and now he's trying to write the second one. But for some reason, he just can't get his hands to do what he wants. And he can't start this book. So him and his wife kind of do this trial separation that she says isn't a separation. But it kind of clearly is because she's, she's really mad at him and there's just no love to be had. And he goes to this, this cottage in, in like this part of America where it's close to being like a fishing town and... It's all wintry and, and it's moody and overcast and everything. And he kind of sparks up this, this unconventional friendship with a teenager who um, is, is kind of in the same boat as him, who's confused, who's having a rough time, and she's had a tragedy in her life that kind of links him to him. And the, the thing that makes it so different to your, your average, you know, fucking this kind of movie is uh, Jeff Daniel has an imaginary superhero friend. And he's called Captain Excellent, and it just so happens that the awesome Ryan Reynolds plays him, who's looking ripped as shit and packed into the, the Superman-esque outfit. And it's a really interesting dynamic, knowing that this kid, that, that Ryan Reynolds isn't really there, it's just a form of the main character's subconscious, you know, trying to protect him from, from a life that he dare not face. And... There's, there's also this big twist in the movie because one of Emma Stone's friends, who's always with her, turns out to be an imaginary friend as well. So they're both kind of linked by the fact that they have this self-defense mechanism that's protecting them. And uh, I, I say it's a twist. It's not really a twist. It's as obvious as semen in a fucking news bukkake Japanese porn flake. 
and I actually read on IMDb uh, a review for it, and the girl on it was basically saying she gave it an extra star because of the twist. It's like, lady, there was no fucking twist. This is not, you know, Sixth Sense. This is not Saw, where the dude gets up off the floor at the end. This is clearly obvious that this kid should not be in the situations that he's in. Nobody interacts with him, and you're the only person that seems to even remotely contact this guy. It's, it's so fucking obvious, it's unreal. But it also ties into a, a really unique and interesting story mechanic. But right there, uh, that dude that I just beat up, you'll notice that as soon as I hit him, an icon went above his head to do a quick time event. This is one of the malfunctioning robots, and when you do the quick time event, it does what it just did then. It releases an EMP, which will stun all of the surrounding enemies and enable you to get some easy quick kills. So make sure you do it. That guy's about to call in reinforcements, but it doesn't matter because I need the experience because it is early on. And uh, if I remember correctly, I get my ass handed to me on this fight because uh, I get really sloppy. And you'll notice uh, I cancelled out of the animation of doing the super move. And uh, what I mean by that is, when my staff was glowing gold, it enables me to do a one-hit kill. But if you do, if you hold block during the animation of it, you can cancel it at any moment. And you can actually cancel it before the blow is delivered, thus wasting the entire special move. And it's not something I would recommend doing, because it's kind of pointless and counterproductive, but... If you get yourself into a situation where you need to do it, just know that you can cancel a lot of the moves by holding block. Uh, it's nowhere near as responsive as a Ninja Gaiden or a Devil May Cry, but it's definitely useful, so do bear in mind. But you have to clear out those enemies there. When I first got to this area, I tried running around them and trying to see if I could do whatever needed to be done, but you will never trigger the cutscene where Trip tells you what she wants you to do unless you kill the enemies, so it's better to, to clear them all out so that you can get on with it. Now this is actually a, a bit of a puzzle room this, because what you have to do is you have to use three me mechanisms to, to lower uh, a series of, of rigs that have lights on them, so that you can jump across and swing on this statue of, which looks like, I think it's, it's either a fairy or an angel, and it's going to help you get to the next section of the game, because it's going to crush the dog that's going to turn up, which is the, the mechanical machine that's been stalking us throughout this level. But um, throw Trip onto your back because a lot of the shit she can't climb up and you will have to throw her. So it's always better to make sure she's with you than to rely on the AI's, you know, path moving ability. But up she goes. Here's a little exposition showing you the cutscene. Showing you all the nonsense of, of what's going on and what she's doing. Which is pretty much just coming up here, press a button, do this, do that. There's the skip. That's the lighting rig that we have to mess with so that we can form a path but I think before we can do anything uh, I have to go over to that that mask that artifact there so we can see another one of the visions that seems to be a home movie filmed by Andy Serkis in his spare time and if you're wondering what the fuck that's all about the ending does explain it and it's actually a really really cool twist I'm not gonna give it away because apparently people watch these videos before they play the game which fucking baffles me but there you go <laughs> So just drop down, go towards the mask, it's then going to trigger what we have to do, because I think it, it triggers the dog to turn up. And uh, it's just a, an invisible tripwire to, to force the game to, to adapt to the next section. But yeah, I've been playing through Red Faction Armageddon, and I started uh, my first playthrough on it, I started on Insane, which is the hardest difficulty, and... I was actually kind of worried if I'm telling the complete and honest truth, not that I tell anything but... Uh, and the reason for this was, when I played the demo, I got my ass kicked. Uh, I didn't really understand how to fight the enemies, they all moved really fast, all the weapons seemed to be really useless, and uh, I just didn't really like it, and I kept falling over because uh, when you're blowing shit up on those games, you generally blow the platforms that you're standing on, and the platforms are the only thing stopping you from falling into the abyss and seeing a loading screen, and that happened a lot to me. So in the main game, I was really worried that I was going to get my ass kicked until I figured out, you know, how to play and how to approach the scenarios. But as it turns out, the game's really simple once you figure it out. I'm, I'm about six levels in, four, maybe four or five levels in. And you get given the one gun that's pretty much going to rule the entire game right at the start, and it's the magnet gun. And I'm absolutely stunned how powerful it is. It's probably the most overpowered starting weapon since the plasma cutter. It, it's, it's that good. And the one downside of it is very similar to the plasma cutter as well. Uh, you have to be able to aim to use it. And 
this is um, a lot more challenging to aim with than the plasma cutter is because um, although the necromorphs can move very fast on dead space they don't move nowhere near as fast as these stupid luminescent motherfuckers on, on red faction but the, the general strategy that I'm working with right now is when I get into a situation which is the combat on the game where you take on the giant red fucking dudes and the green dudes and everything instead of shooting them with any of the explosives or blowing shit up or shooting them with the assault rifles and using the environment I just put the magnet gun on and start firing them into whichever surface I can put a magnet on that is furthest away from where they are. And what it does is, it obviously connects them to, to the other magnet, so it zooms them across the room and they smash into the wall and it instantly kills them. And it's killing every enemy I've come across except for the big tank guys in, in one hit if it's a, a decent enough distance. So... It's a little fussy on the, the aiming to, to hit them with the magnet, but as soon as you do, you're pretty much guaranteed a kill. And because of the physics engine and the ability for the environment to destruct the way it does, sometimes you'll kill stuff you didn't even mean to kill by debris randomly falling. And it's it's proving to be really simple. Uh, I've, I've only killed one boss so far. I don't know how many more there is. I've done uh, a whole bunch of sections involving the, the mechanized suit, which is really fun. It's just as fun as it was in the demo. And I'm actually enjoying the, the linear features of the game. I do believe, though, it's trying to be Dead Space far too much. And I don't know why they've gone for it, because... If you're going to follow a game that did something really, really well when everybody didn't really realise it was going to, you've got to be really fucking good at what you're trying to pull off, because you are imitating something that has redefined a bar, something that has set a level so high that people are going to know if you fuck it up, people are going to know if you miss the mark, and... It's kind of missing the mark, because it tries to achieve a bit of atmosphere, a bit of tension, because it's got really moody lighting. The lighting engine's not very good at all, truth be told. And um, you lose all the fear, you lose all the tension when the enemies turn up, because they're all a bunch of fucking like labyrinth has -beens. And they just jump around, they're all luminescent like fireworks, and they, they, they're just generic and kind of crappy. But... The, the trick to this is, is pulling the levers in an order, and you actually have to push the levers so that the lighting rig is up high instead of down low. If you do it down low, it will enable you to get a cache of orbs that's over there on that little shelf, but you can completely skip them because you don't necessarily need them, especially if you're not going for the upgrades. But right now, I'm kind of thinking if I can get across to the other platform because I've pushed these... This is not the most efficient way to approach this puzzle, and I do apologise, but it's one of those things where... Um, unless I used the guide to make the guide, I would have never done it first time in the perfect order. And I don't really like the concept of using a guide to make a guide. The only situations that I'm going to be doing anything remotely like that is if I ever start doing collectibles or if I ever start doing things, you know, like rank based achievement guides, stuff like that. Because uh, if you have to abide by a rank or if you have to get, you know, a certain rating on a level, you need to know every nook and cranny of what you're A, going to fuck up. Or what you need to accomplish before you can hit it. But keep on jumping around this amphitheater. Keep on doing your thing. And so once you've lined it up like I believe I've just done. You can now jump across. And when you get to the end of this it will trip the cutscene and mark the end of the level. I do believe. Because the chandelier or the lighting rig it falls on the dog. It neutralizes it and it enables you and Trip to escape once again. But you haven't escaped it for long, it does show up in the next level and we finally get to fight it, which is nowhere near as intimidating as it first was when I fought it. So I will see you in that video. Thanks for watching people and uh, you take care now.